Hey folks, welcome to the Power of Zero show. I am your host, David McKnight, best-selling author of The Power of Zero, Look Before You Lerp, The Volatility Shield, and Tax-Free Income for Life, all of which can be purchased in, uh, in single at Amazon, wherever you buy fine books, or in bulk at uh, davidmcknightbooks.com. Com. You can mix and match purchases and achieve bulk discounts. If you are looking for help uh, navigating your path to the 0% tax bracket, we're happy to do so. We can refer you to one of the uh, top uh, Power Zero advisors in the country, a member of our elite POZ advisor group. Uh, just head over to davidmcknight.com and fill in the intake form. And if you are an advisor who would like to do likewise with your clients, then head over to powerofzero.com. Uh, very, very excited to have uh, to show you the second part of our interview uh, with Maya McGinnis. Once again, it was a ri- wide-ranging discussion, uh, sobering, but very, very useful in terms of arousing us all to our faculties about the fiscal course uh, of our nation and what we can do to get back on track. And remember, uh, be thinking about a lot of the powers of your principles as we talk about the reality of higher taxes down the road and what we uh, will be facing uh, from a fiscal perspective as a country. So sit back, relax. Here is the second part of my interview with Maya McGinnis. Yeah, so we know that every year that goes by um, where we fail to address all of these sort of intractable um, financial issues means sort of the fix on the back end. Every year that we fail to address it means the fix on the back end is going to be even more aggressive, even more draconian. And it seems like politicians are in a state of mind right now where they don't, like you said, they don't want to address it. They're acting like seventh, second graders and they're just making promises in exchange for votes, which tells me that, you know, nothing's really going to change in the foreseeable future. As you look into your crystal ball, where do you see the country 10 years from now, if nothing changes? The thing about the, the damage that the debt does is in many ways, it's invisible. So like you said, we're already worse off because we waited so long and take something like Social Security. We should have fixed Social Security decades ago. I wrote my master's thesis on how we should fix Social Security, and that was quite some time ago. And we have done nothing to improve the finances. And every single year, the trustees tell us that the system is going to become insolvent with in just a little over a decade now. That's really soon if you're thinking about retiring. And insolvent doesn't mean you will get no benefits. It means you'll get a huge benefit cut of about 25% of what you're, you've been promised. That's for Bill Gates. That's for the 95-year-old widow. It's brutal. It's across the board. And if we had made these changes years ago, we could have fixed Social Security without affecting a single person who depends on the system, either on the revenue side or the spending side. Um, meaning those of us who could have afforded to contribute more and or have a slower growth of our benefits, the entire thing could have fixed by asking us to all contribute. But we didn't. And so now even that won't be enough. Like you won't be able to just lift the tax, the the tax max, which is part of how um, it's the payroll tax is only goes up to a certain amount. Used to be if you lifted that, you could basically fix the program. It won't get us there anymore. So that waiting has cost us tremendously in terms of how big the benefits are. Um, and I think that's that's a huge concern. Um, so if you look at where where we're headed, and, and I don't think that the politicians will come up and, and make the choices on their own, what will happen is we will continue to see slower growth in the economy than we otherwise would. We already have. So our economy today is smaller than it would have been if they had fixed this earlier. That means our standard of living is already lower. So that will continue to happen. So economic growth, mobility, income growth will be slower than it otherwise would have. But I look at it as less, that's bad, but I look at it as the real concern is our national security issues. Our ability to respond to the threats around the world without the economic dominance, which we have been used to, is greatly diminished. And I think that's what's gonna happen. And you're seeing that in the rivalry with China all over the place. We don't have the, funds or either the ability to borrow or willingness to pay for um, a lot of the things that we could be doing to have more uh, long-term focus on our national security and our geopolitical positioning in the world. We should be thinking a lot more in terms of longer-term investments in human capital and infrastructure. We should have done that decades ago. It's going to be a dangerous game of catch-up. 
And I think another example is technology is going to change the world so much and the workforce and the nature of work. But we've done nothing to revamp our social contract to deal with that, where our social contract is still almost purely focused on benefits for seniors through health care and retirement. When what we should be thinking about is not only investment in early years in human capital, but the real risks are you work in a field where there is total disruption and that field is gone. You need uh, to find a new job. You need to be fully retrained. You need to not become depressed because it's a terrible thing to have happen. And we need a social contract that recognizes these changes so that we can be working productively, productively with the new innovations that are coming along so quickly. But instead, you're waiting to get Social Security and Medicare. But if you're the 32-year-old worker who entered a, a field that suddenly is becoming irrelevant, there's not a lifelong learning system in place to help you. So those are just examples of it is quite literally the underpinning of our entire economy, our fiscal health. And as our fiscal health weakens, our ability to meet all the new challenges of this century is greatly diminished. And I think we will be a dangerously weak country for it. And I don't want to spin out my depressing, my depressing fears too much, but I think there's a lot of tension and friction in this country already. And a economic pie that's not growing exacerbates that friction massively. And I'm very concerned about that in a polarized environment with a more stagnant economy. Right. So um, you touched on this earlier. We, we know that historically the way that you deal with spending issues is you either raise more revenue, cut spending, or some combination of the two. Um, of late, as you rightly noted, we are starting to hear more and more about this idea of modern monetary theory. And I, I joke with my literary agent because um, I share the same literary agent as Stephanie Kelton, who wrote The Deficit Method. So I like to give him a hard time because her views are basically in diametrical opposition to my own. Can you speak a little bit to, uh, we already know we're on sort of this, this wobbly fiscal trajectory. What happens if the modern monetary so-called theorists get into power and start to try to print their way out of our problems? How does that affect everything? Well, I mean, yes, MMT um, it basically starts by stating the obvious. And it says you can't default if you borrow in your own currency. And that's right, we can't default. That in no way should be reassuring to anybody. Just because we're not going to default does not mean we have a healthy economy. So if what your argument is, don't worry, you can just keep printing money, obviously you're going to bump into massive inflation and hyperinflation likely. And the even more dangerous part of this is that uh, MMTers, and it's not really a theory in that it's always changing. The smartest economists out there, whether it's a Larry Summers or a Paul Krugman, all of them say, you know, this, these are on the left, say, I can't even follow this theory. Like every time you punch a hole and poke a hole in it, they, are, they come up with a new claim. So it's sort of a shapeshifter of a quote unquote theory. <laughs> but the other argument, in, in, in addition to don't worry, we can just keep printing this money is, and we don't need the Fed to control it. We'll have fiscal policy really be the area where you control inflation. So if you do see inflation, we're going to raise taxes. Now, much of our discussion has been about how our politicians are unwilling to raise taxes or cut spending or do anything difficult. And if you think that Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer are going to suddenly say, oh, I see an, a blip in the CPI that looks troubling. We need to raise taxes. You know, you're not living under this government structure because there's no way that you could count on that fiscal policy situation. So it's a recipe for massive inflation. Um, which a lot of people aren't old enough to remember how painful that and scary that can be, but that can wipe away your savings. I sometimes wonder if um, the people, the, the MMTers, uh, just don't understand that inflation is such a problem. And so they're like, well, if that's the biggest risk, maybe it doesn't matter. Inflation can wipe away your entire savings and it can create an economic recession that is nasty to try to get out of. And your standard of living can plummet. And it's really, really harmful and painful to uh, most everybody throughout the economy. And it's very difficult to get out of. It's very difficult to recover from. It's not something we should be taking lightly. So I think it's really dangerous. And then recently there's been this huge confluence of saying, look, we borrowed during the downturn right now and that was the right thing to do. And that shows MMT is working. 
No, it doesn't. That's normal Keynesian economics, where you want to borrow during your downturns and then save more during your good turns, your, your upturns, and so that over time your economy is roughly in balance. That's nothing close to MMT, but it's sort of like, what is it? The, the broken clock is right twice a day, whatever that saying is, right? <laughs> like, so sometimes you'll be in the business cycle where it does make sense to be borrowing more. That's in no way validating this, this approach of like, don't worry, everything's basically free and we'll just print money. And uh, I, I think it's dangerous because it's so seductive. What politician wouldn't meet with someone who says, here's the newest theory on why being worried about paying for things is a total waste of time and in fact it's damaging okay that sounds great you know if you if you can convince someone it's true and there are a lot of people who would like it to be true but that doesn't make it true and it does in fact mean it's it will be quite damaging for when we bumped up to the parameters of that yeah doc, dr uh larry kotlikoff who was on our uh, podcast last week he had an interesting way of characterizing the economists who have sort of embraced MMT. He says, uh, you know, he referenced the, um, the story of Icarus. He says, economists need to be sort of right in the middle where they're not being pulled either by one side or the other, like Icarus who gets either too close to the sun or too close to the water. If economists end up embracing any political ideology too much, then everything that they learned, you know, their, their PhD essentially goes out the window because they're blinded by, by political ideology. They're no longer embracing, you know, standard economics, real world economics and the sort of the economic rules of, of, of the universe. So, so this is a tough question in closing particularly for someone who's in your position. Are, are there any politicians out there on either side of the aisle who have the political will or the, uh, yeah, the, the, the willpower to make these tough decisions to get the country back on track? There absolutely are. Um, I'm not going to go through the list of names. Um, I work with so many of them. I work with a great group in the House right now, 30 and 30, and it's a bunch of, it's 30 Republicans, 30 Democrats, and when COVID hit, they came together and wrote a letter to their leadership and said, we all of very different political backgrounds believe we do need to borrow for this emergency. And we should not, you know, stop, stop borrowing when that's the most important thing we need to do. But at the same time, we all agree that our national debt situation is very dangerous. It was before COVID hit and it's going to be worse so after. So once we get through this, it's very important we start to take the measures to help fix the situation. And they identified putting in place a fiscal commission um, or adopting a bipartisan bicameral bill out there called trust, which says anytime one of our government trust funds is on track to become insolvent, we should have a special committee that comes up with, with um, recommendations for how to fix it. Can you imagine AARP has decided to protest that? AARP that's supposed to represent the seniors of this country is out there phone banking against a bill which says, if a program is supposed to on track to become insolvent, according to its trustees, you should take measures to fix it. And they're saying, don't you dare, writing all sorts of postcards. It's scaremongering at its worst. And this is not a non-political bill, by the way. It doesn't say how you would do it. It's completely up to the folks who'd come up with it. It has to have bipartisan support. But that's the problem with the city. A lot of people make, make their money, raise their money by scaring people and particularly seniors. And I think it's terrible that the group that's supposed to represent seniors is at the front in doing that. Um, but so there are many politicians out there who have said, you know, we need to look at how to fix these programs or have a commission or at least something called the fiscal state of the nation, which is um, just a statement every year by the Comptroller General or the head of CBO on what our fiscal situation is. Because while I'm passionate about it and think it's fascinating, not every American looks this up every day. Um, we have tons of budget tools and I hope your listeners will go check them out on our website where you can learn more about them and play with them in a way that's more accessible. But I think it's really important people have access to those numbers. So these groups are out there and they're working together and there are some in the Senate as well. They're more in the headlines right now. And many of them are willing to do the right thing, but they can't do the right thing in isolation. You can't be a Republican and go out there and say, I'm gonna tell you the truth. We do have to raise taxes. There's not enough spending to cut to do it with the revenues we have. And you can't be a Democrat and goes out there and says, I'm gonna tell you the truth. 
of course we have to fix Social Security and Medicare. We should have not years, but decades ago. And people have been scaremongering forever to keep us from doing that. And they're letting it be someone else's problem. They could go say that, many of them know that, but they would get politically demolished. And there's no point in having people who are willing to do the right thing kind of walk a fiscal plank and, and not get anything done. So the question is, where is the window of opportunity? And you definitely need leadership at the top. You're never gonna have a grassroots movement that goes out there and says, please raise my taxes, cut my spending, fix the situation. It's necessary for both our economy and our national security. Um, I wish I wish we would, but if I tried to arrange a march, I bet my own kids wouldn't even come. It'd be a small little march. It's not, a, it doesn't lend itself to grassroots um, outrage of which there's many things that people are, are focusing on these days that make more sense at that level. But you do have a lot of people in the grassroots who, if they hear their political leaders talking about it and they're people they trust, they know it's right. They know that this doesn't make sense for the country. So ideally, you'd have some leadership at the top. Um, and that means the president or the leaders of the party. If you don't do that, you could put some rules in place. Right now, our budget, which we almost never pass, there's almost never an actual budget in place. But if you do pass a budget, it has no requirements for what the fiscal metrics are, how far, um, how much you could borrow, what the limitations are. We could change our budget process so it forced the politicians to make more reasonable choices. I'm not a big fan of a balanced budget amendment. I think that's usually used as a replacement for actually talking about what policies you'd use to get there. And then many times you don't need to balance the budget per se, but I am a fan of debt targets or limiting how much you would borrow and making sure your debt's not growing faster than your economy. And if you put those rules in place, it would force the politicians to do what actually a lot of them know does need to get done. Now, I'm not saying there aren't people who believe MMT and tax cuts pay for themselves nonsense. There are. Not everybody is not everybody is a fiscal genius in Congress. I'll say that. But a lot of them are. A lot of them get it. A lot of them came up through the states where they work on the finances of the states and their budgets, and they are frustrated. And they would like to see this work differently. So it's more about creating a political opening. And I'll just end on kind of the theme for me, which is, in this moment of polarization, that is really difficult to find. We are asking our politicians to give us things for free and spend all their time beating up on each other instead of to govern in a way that is healthy for the economy and sustainable for the economy. And if we don't push them to do that, it's gonna be very hard for them to do it all on their own. So yes, there are a lot of great members of Congress with a bunch of crummy ones sprinkled in there. Um, <laughs> And there's a real chance that they could come together, but uh, we're going to have to figure out how to work together as one country to solve these big problems if we want to see them rise to that challenge. Very good. Maya, how, how can my listeners learn more about you and learn more about your organization? Well, my favorite thing for them to do uh, would be to go look at these budget tools because I'm really excited about them. But our name, which is impossible to remember, but it's the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. So you can look at us on the website and sign up if you want super wonky papers um, about what's in the president's budget or the debt trajectory or lots of different topics. Um, sign up for that material. We would love that. But there's also a suite of interactive tools that people can look at. And you can go on our website and find them or you can go to budgeting for the future. And there's a budget quiz and a personality test. What, what is your what is budget personality? There's one of my favorite tools, which is called Zoomers versus Boomers, and it looks at how we allocate the budget for the generations. Really interesting, surprising, and troubling facts there. One which is called More or Less, and you just you zip through it. We we're kind of inspired by making a Tinder for the budget, but we couldn't quite make it swipe the way we wanted to. But it's like, this is how much we spend on defense per person. Do you want to spend more or less? And it's interesting to see what those numbers are. So all of those tools are there, and I would really value people looking at them and sharing the results. And if you, you don't have to give us the, your answers, but if you do, we're using it as an opportunity to crowdsource what people think are our national priorities and share it with Congress. Because in this moment where there's such a big divide in the country, but also between citizens and, and lawmakers, we want to engage people in this process. So we're really looking at it as a chance to share what people think, where your national priorities are. There's another tool that says, how much would you pay? Who should pay, how much, and how much should we borrow? 
So maybe you disagree with me. Maybe you think we should be borrowing for all of this. There's a chance to weigh in on that as well. Um, but the tools are meant to be both educational and believe it or not, fun, I say question mark, but I think you could pull off a Friday night dinner party with a budget tool as the centerpiece of conversation. Very good. Well, Maya McGinnis, you've been very um, generous with your time. Thank you for coming on the Power Zero show. Pleasure to join you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. Well, thank you very much. That was excellent. Really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, happy to do it. I'll go check yeah. all this out. Okay, keep in touch. All right, will do. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Okay, folks, that was part two of my interview with Maya McGinnis. Once again, if you are looking for help uh, navigating your way to the 0% tax bracket, you want to circumnavigate all the pitfalls that stand between you and a tax-free retirement, we're happy to help. Uh, head over to davidmcknight.com, fill in the intake form. We will refer you to one of the top powers of your advisors in the nation, one of our uh, members of our elite POZ advisor group. And if you are a financial advisor, we can help you as well, uh, help you uh, level up your practice to uh, become the tax-free retirement specialist in your part of the country. Head over to powerofzero.com. Once again, would love a follow on Twitter. Please feel free to uh, give a fair and honest review of our podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts and would love a review of any of our books uh, along with our movie, The Power of Zero, The Tax Train is Coming. I thank you all for being on the show today and we will look forward to chatting with you same time next week.